I'm really happy to be here um, and, um, and talking to this group because, um, and I'm going to talk about kind of the macro issues. About, you have people like, um, like Kevin Series, my friend, I'm, I'm on his uh, the board of advisors for Series Materials, and I think he keynoted here last year, I was talking to you before, um, talking to you specifically about some of the things that you can do to make the, your facilities more, um, uh, to get a better deal for yourself, for your customers, for your clients, and also to do better things for our planet. I'm going to talk about some of the broader issues, and, and uh, just by way of introduction, I've worked for 27 years for two environmental groups, NRDC, which is the largest environmental group in the country, and which wrote many of the 28 environmental laws, the federal environmental laws, that, uh, that are designed to protect the environment in this country. And then I've also worked at the same time with a grassroots group called River Keepers and now the Water Keeper Alliance, which is an umbrella group for 200 water keepers all over the country, including a, I think a dozen here in California, Santa Monica Bay, San Diego Bay. We have an Orange County Coast Keeper, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, um, and we have basically patrol boats patrolling the waterways up and down the coast uh, and, and protecting local waterways using litigation and law enforcement to protect local waterways against polluters. Um, I started out working with the first keeper, which was a keeper on the Hudson River called the Hudson River. It was originally called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. And it was started by a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized to reclaim the Hudson from its polluters. And this was a, um, a most of them came, we have the oldest commercial fishery in North America on the Hudson, it's, it's 350 years old. Many of the people I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. One of the enclaves of the fishery is a <clears throat> tiny village in Crotonville, New York, um, called, uh, I, I, just north, about 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river called Crotonville. The people who lived there were not affluent environmentalists. They were factory workers, carpenters, lathers, electricians. Half of the people in Crotonville had made their living, or at least some part of it, fishing or crabbing the river. And I really learned my brand of environmentalism from them. And one of the things that they understood and that I understood from the beginning was that we weren't protecting the environment so much for the sake of the fish and the birds. They were, these were small businessmen whose, whose livelihoods and whose property values and whose recreational values uh, depended on a clean river. For them, the Hudson was their environment. Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the Riverkeeper, used to say about the Hudson, it's our Riviera, it's our Monte Carlo. And these were people who had little expectation that they'd ever see Yosemite or Yellowstone at the national parks. They understood that we're protecting the environment because it's the infrastructure of our communities. And that if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a nation, as a civilization, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, We've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, what we call the public trust resources or the commons, those things that are not susceptible to private property ownership, but by their nature are the assets of the entire community, the, the rivers and beaches and the waterways and, and publicly owned landscapes that connect us to our past, to our history, that provide context to our communities, and that are the source, ultimately, of our values and our virtues and our character as a people. Now, these days, if you, if you read the headlines uh, or if you look at the TV, the, the, I think that kind of the driving force behind almost all of our political issues, not just those that are characterized as environmental, all the big crises that we've faced, whether it's the Iraq war or whether it's what's happening in Japan now with the nuclear meltdown, uh, the Gulf oil spill, the death of the miners in Appalachia, and you know many, many, many of the other um, uh, major political crises that we're facing as a globe are rooted in the way that we use energy. 
and um, the way that we extract it, the way that we distribute it and deploy it, um, the way that we use it. Uh, and the biggest challenge that we face is how do we do those things because we need energy and our communities need it for all the things that we value. But how do we do it in a way that doesn't subvert the aspirations of future generations, that doesn't compromise our own quality of life and, and the values of our country? And the other things that, that, um, that, we, that, we, that we put value in. Um, Lord David Putnam gave a speech before Parliament last November when Parliament was debating a cap and trade system that's very similar to the system that we, that we passed in our Congress in the Waxman-Markey bill, but was killed in the Senate, and it was supposed to be the centerpiece of President Obama's um, energy policy. And, um, you know, it was a, it's, a, it's a very basic idea that you put a price on carbon. If somebody is going to use the commons, which we own, you know, the Constitution of the state says the people of the state own the air of the state, they own the waters, they own the fisheries, the wildlife, et cetera. We own those. If somebody is going to dump their waste into, onto our property, they ought to pay a fee for it, and we ought to have a mechanism for, uh, for uh, for deploying that fee that is market-based, that encourages, that allows people to make money and by reducing carbon, and that encourages entrepreneurship and innovation so that we can develop ways that create industries in this country that then become export industries and, it, and so create a market-based infrastructure for, you know, for doing what we were taught to do in kindergarten, which is to clean up after ourselves. So, um, you know, they passed it ultimately to Parliament's credit, they pass it um, in, uh, in Great Britain. But uh, there was a debate about it at first, and, and Lord Putnam, during that debate, was addressing the concerns. In England, virtually everybody accepts the, the science behind global warming. They have been deluged, as we have in this country, by a $200 million propaganda campaign financed by Chevron and, and the Koch brothers and, and Exxon and a number of others to persuade the American people, you know, who have hired these slick PR firms like Burstyn, Marstella, and Hilton Olden, and, and, uh, and created all these phony think tanks on Capitol Hill, like the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, that pretend to love free market capitalism, but they really don't like it. They like corporate crony capitalism and kind of capitalism for the, for the poor and socialism for the rich, and, uh, and corporate profit taking at any cost. Um, but, and then they stock them with these phony scientists, and we call them biostitutes, who will say the American people, <laughs> you know, seat belts are bad for you, or, you know, uh, that cholesterol is, is great for your health, or the whales like being harpooned, or, uh, you know, there's no such thing as global warming. And you spend enough money on it, and people start to, to believe it. That's what, you know, Garibald's used to call the big lie. If you tell it again and again and again, no matter how big it is, people start believing it. And propaganda works. That's why we have an advertising industry, you know, in this country and around the world. It works. So they don't, in England, they haven't had that. And people generally accept the science behind global warming. They understand that it's a grim reality that, that government has to take a firm hand in, in addressing but there were still vested interest in others who said, well, we have to move incrementally, we have to move slowly, because if we move precipitously, it's gonna cause grave dislocations in the markets. That's gonna harm people, and it's gonna impede our capacity to, to maneuver and to adjust to this and other problems as we go forward. And Lloyd Putnam was addressing specifically the concerns of that cohort, and he reminded Parliament that exactly 200 years before, the same body had debated the abolition of the slave trade in England. And at that time, virtually everybody in England was opposed to slavery. They saw it as, a, as an abomination, as a moral catastrophe that, that had to be ended. But the question was, how do you do it? Because slavery represented 25% of the GNP of Great Britain. It was the principal source of energy for the entire British Empire, free human labor. And they said, if we were to abolish it outright, that the economy would crater. Well, after a year of debate, Parliament made the moral choice and abolished slavery literally overnight. And instead of collapsing, 
the British economy exploded as thousands of entrepreneurs rushed into that space to create new forms of energy, mainly mechanical ones, in an era that we now know as the Industrial Revolution, which was the greatest epic in wealth creation in the history of mankind. And the abolition of slavery had exposed all of these hidden inefficiencies that were associated with free human bondage. Well, today, we don't need to abolish carbon to understand that our deadly addiction to it is the principal drag on American capitalism. We are borrowing a billion dollars a day in our country, mainly from nations that don't share our values, in order to import a billion dollars of oil a day. And again, largely, a lot of that comes, again, from nations that don't share our values, some that are outright hostile to us. We're funding, essentially, both sides of the war against terror through our addiction to oil. Um, we give $1.3 trillion annually to the oil industry, the richest industry in the history of mankind. And if you have doubts about that figure, incidentally, look at Terry Tamman in his new book, Lives Per Gallon, which, uh, and as many of you know, Terry Tamman had just stepped down as head of California EPA. And he's written this, he's, uh, he's done an extraordinary job of compiling all of the, um, you know, and inventorying all of this vast raft of subsidies that we give to the oil industry every year. And they include 35 to $55 billion direct federal cash from the oil depletion allowance and you know, a, a, a lot of different um, tax programs, but also principally indirect subsidies like the $100 billion we spend annually protecting the oil pipelines in the Gulf, giving military protection. This is the before the Iraq war, which I saw OMB this week said the Iraq war over 20 years is going to cost $4.3 trillion. Well, that should be billed to their account because that's the price for our, our if, if we weren't addicted to that oil, we wouldn't be bearing that price as a society. And, um, and then, you know, crop damage and human health, $156 billion in human health damage from mainly from benzene, but from some of the other uh, byproducts of, of burning oil, of just respiratory damage, and on and on. Um, we give uh, to the, to the uh, nuke industry, we give about a half a trillion dollars in subsidies annually, um, and they, you know, they include, uh, I, I, and it, 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 anyway, this is, it's turned out to be that, you know, they told us, I remember when I was a boy, um, the nuke industry's talking about how it was gonna be too cheap to meter. And it, as it turns out, it's the most catastrophically expensive way to boil a pot of water that's ever been devised. And I, people always say to me, on, from the industry, and I, you know, some of these people are, are friends of mine because they run the you know, utilities and stuff, and they've got fleets of power plants. They say, well, you know, uh, other than Japan and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, we have a really you know, great record. <laughs> and uh, I say you know, to them, well, if it's safe, you know, then get an insurance policy like everybody else. They, you know, they can't get an insurance policy. I mean, not only do we have to, uh, there's, there's not a single utility in this country that will build a nuclear power plant unless 100% of the construction is funded by the U.S. taxpayer. And then there's not, and then we have to store the stuff, you and I, the f federal taxpayer, for the next 30,000 years, which is you know, five times the length of recorded human history. And plus, the biggest subsidy is they don't have to pay insurance. And if they did, they couldn't function a marketplace. So they had to go to Congress, and the industry said to them, we're not gonna insure you, or if we do, it's gonna be so high, you're not gonna be able to you know, sell any energy. So they had to go to Congress in a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night and pass the Price-Anderson Act, which absolves them of all responsibility for, you know, for radiation releases from their plants, so that if, if you go home and look at your home insurance owner's policy, in every home insurance policy in the country, there's a provision that says this policy does not insure you against radiation contamination because coming from a nuclear power plant, from an accident or attack. And what other industry has that? You know, and they, but they had to have that absolution in order to function. And what I always say to them is, if you're safe, you know, if you're safe, get an insurance policy. In, in, a, in, a, in a free market capitalist society, which we're supposed to be, the insurance industry is the final arbiter of risk. And if you can't get a policy, it means you're too, too dangerous, too risky to operate. So, um, and then 
the coal industry probably gets more subsidies than, than anybody else. Nobody has actually done um, a, a really a good accounting of it. It's all public information, but nobody's really done a good accounting of it. But I've spent 27 years litigating against the coal industry, and I, um, in the past month, I filed three new suits against, um, against coal, uh, coal burning utility, coal, no, coal companies in the state of Kentucky. But I, wa I had a six and a half week jury trial in West Virginia two years ago now, and about six months ago, I went to argue the appeal. I won the biggest decision, uh, the biggest judgment in the history of the state of West Virginia. I went back and argued the, uh, the appeal of that victory in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court about six months ago, and as I was leaving the state, I was driving on a highway. I was being driven on a highway back to the airport, and it, and it felt like, and it was a federal highway. I felt like I was driving on a cushion. It was so soft, and the ride was so smooth. It was like a skateboard park. It was very, very, it was, it was you know, it was flat as you can get. And I said to the driver, and this is unusual in West Virginia, because although it's the richest in resource of any state in the country, it's the poorest state in the country. So it's another thing when they tell you that, you know, coal brings prosperity. It actually brings poverty these days. But I said to the driver, so most of the roads are, are pretty bad in West Virginia. I said to the driver, how come this road feels, you know, like we're driving on a, a cushion or a carpet? And he said, well, there's 22 inches of asphalt on this road. Well, the Massachusetts Turnpike has four inches. The New York State Thruway has six to eight inches. And every inch costs millions of dollars per mile for that state taxpayers. And I knew why there had to be 22 inches of asphalt on those roads in West Virginia, because the coal trucks weigh 90,000 pounds and they pulverize a less robust road. So, but, but the coal industry isn't paying for those, those roads. It's you, in that case of that road, it's you and I. It's the federal taxpayer. There's 3,000 miles of coal roads in West Virginia that have the same thing. And most of it, it's the people of the state which is one of the reasons the state's so impoverished. So, and that's a subsidy to the coal industry that they don't tell you about when they say, oh, it's only 11 cents a kilowatt hour. Because they're not telling you that you're also paying out of another pocket for their coal road. In August of last year, the National Academy of Sciences published a, a five-year study that showed that every freshwater fish in America is now contaminated with mercury. It's coming from coal-burning power plants. And we're living today in a science fiction nightmare. I pay 30 bucks for a fishing license every year in New York State. But today, every fish in New York State has dangerous levels of mercury, every freshwater fish, dangerous levels of mercury in it. So this, this industry has essentially privatized all the fish in New York State. In order to make themselves richer, they've stolen something from the public and made it so that we can't use it anymore. The Constitution of New York says the fish of the state belong to the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody can use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. It's called the public trust doctrine. It's 2,000 years old. It was in the Code of Justinian, it's in the Magna Carta, and it's in the Constitution of every state. It applies to the waters, the com all the commons, the, the fish, the water, the air, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the public lands, um, uh, wandering animals, etc. So, um, and if CDC, according to CDC, one out of every six American women now has so much mercury in her womb that her children are at risk for a grim inventory of diseases, including autism, blindness, mental retardation, heart, liver, and kidney disease. Um, there are six, I actually got my levels tested recently. My mercury levels are 10 times from eating fish because I fish a lot and I eat the fish are 10 times what EPA considers safe. I was told by Dr. David Carpenter, who is the National Authority on Mercury Contamination Toxicity, that a woman with my levels of mercury would have um, children with cognitive impairment, with permanent brain damage. I said to him, you mean she might have it? He said, no, 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 the science is very certain today. Her children have some level of permanent uh, neurological injury, probably, he said, at my level is an IQ loss of about five to seven points. Well, today, according to CDC, there are 647,000 children born in this country every year who have been exposed to dangerous levels of mercury in their mother's wombs. Well, that's a cost of coal that they don't tell you about when they say it's only 11 cents a kilowatt hour. 
Um, if you go back to your room or to your you know, home tonight and look at, at EPA's website, you'll see a, a study there by the Harvard School of Public Health, but also a whole series of studies but that say that, um, that ozone and particulates coming from coal burning power plants kill 60,000 Americans every year. That's 20 times the number of people who were killed in the World Trade Center attacks, but not just once, year after year after year. 10 million asthma attacks annually, a million lost work days. Well, these are costs of coal that they don't tell you about when they say it's only 11 cents a kilowatt hour. These are the externalized costs of coal. I live in, the, uh, in Westchester County, New York, two hours south from the Adirondacks where I take my kids fishing and kayaking and camping and, and skiing. And this is the oldest protected wilderness on the face of the earth. It's been protected as forever wild since 1888. And we had a right, the American people, to believe that generations of our citizens would be able to enjoy those pristine landscapes unspoiled. But today, one-fifth of the lakes in the Adirondacks is sterilized from acid rain, which has also destroyed the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec. And that's another cost of coal, externalized cost of coal. The coal ash piles, which were unregulated until this year, and now Lisa Jackson from EPA is saying for the first time they're regulated, but um, they're believed to have caused water damage, very, very toxic um, groundwater damage in 700 communities across the country, large communities. When I flew out of Appalachia this last time, I flew over the Cumberland uh, Plateau, and I saw something that if the American people could see it, there'd be a revolution in this country. We're literally cutting down the Appalachian Mountains with these giant machines called drag lines. They're 22 stories high. I flew under one of them in a Piper Cup. They cost a half a billion dollars for a single machine, and they practically dispensed with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. When my father was fighting strip mining in Appalachia back in the 60s, so I remember a conversation I had with him when I was 14 years old, where he said to me, and at that time, the strip mines were very, very small you know, compared to what they're doing today. He said to me, they're not just destroying the environment, they're permanently impoverishing these communities because there's no way that they can regenerate an economy from these barren moonscapes that are left behind. And he said, they're doing it so they can break the unions, which indeed is, is exactly what they did. When, they, when he told me that, there were 151,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia digging coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there are fewer than 18,000 miners left in the state. Only half of them are unionized, and they're taking more coal out of West Virginia than they were in 1968. The only difference is back then, at least some of that money was being left in West Virginia for salaries and pensions and reinvestment in the community. Today, virtually all of it goes straight up to Wall Street to you know, do the out-of-state companies, um, Massey Coal, Arch Coal, Peabody and Consul, that own 95% of the coal in West Virginia is owned by out-of-state interests, mainly Wall Street interests, who obtained it from swindlers who got you know locals to sign illiterate locals to sign an X, you know, back in the 1880s, and then to the big banking houses like um, like Chase and J.P. Morgan Chase, which funds these operations, and and to some extent Citibank and uh, Wells Fargo has now said they're not going to do it anymore. But these companies are essentially literate. Um, liquidating the state for cash with these giant machines, the drag lines, and 2,400 tons of ammonia nitrate explosives they detonate every day in West Virginia. It's the equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb once a week. They're blowing the tops off the mountains to get at the cold uh, seams underneath, and they take the rock and debris and rubble and they scrape it at the adjacent <coughs> river valley. According to EPA, over the past 10 years, they flattened an area larger than the state of Delaware, 1.4 million acres. They've cut down the 500 biggest mountains in West Virginia. They filled 2,200 miles of rivers and streams, permanently gone with, the, you know, with this rubble. So, and it's totally illegal. You cannot in the United States take rock and debris and rubble and dump it into a waterway without a clean water permit. So we sued them in front of a conservative Republican federal judge, Judge Charles Hayden, and he said the same thing I said. He said, it's all illegal. It's been illegal since day one. And he enjoined all mountaintop mining. Two days from when we got that decision, lobbyists for Peabody Coal and Massey met in the back door of the, the Interior Department with Gail Norton's first deputy chief. This was during the Bush administration. Um, 
and his name is Stephen J. Griles, and he was a former lobbyist for P.B. Cole and Massey. He's now serving a 10 and a half month jail sentence in the federal penitentiary. But it's too late for the mountaintops because they made a deal where they changed the interpretation of one word of the Clean Water Act, the definition of the word fill, to change 30 years of statutory interpretation, effectively overrule Judge Hayden's decision to make it legal as it is today not just in West Virginia, but every other state, including California, to dump rock, debris, rubble, garbage, construction waste, any solid material into any waterway of the United States without a Clean Water Act permit. All you need today, excuse me, is a rubber stamp permit from the Corps of Engineers, which in some districts you can get over the telephone or through the mail. And this is why I always say, you know, whenever you see large scale destruction of the environment, you'll also see the subversion of American democracy. You'll see the disappearance of the public process at the local level. You'll see the erosion of transparency in government, which is a key aspect of democracy. You'll see the capture of the agencies that are supposed to be protecting us from pollution. They become sock puppets to the, you know, the regulated industry, which you see in West Virginia, and you'll see um, the corruption of public officials. And all of those things are present in West Virginia. And that, that has a cost, that subversion of democracy imposes a cost on the rest of us that you can't really measure in dollars and cents, but it goes directly to America and its values, and it is a cost nevertheless. So um, we know this, that these, uh, that these subsidies, are, they're called also externalities, but they're really subsidies to the incumbents, to coal, um, oil, and, and new. Uh, the principal barrier to us adopting much more efficient um, and uh, less costly for, and, uh, uh, forms of energy that, that are consistent with American values. The, um, we know this also. We know that every nation that has decarbonized its society has experienced instantaneous prosperity. Iceland in 1970 was the poorest country in Europe. It was 100% dependent on imported coal and oil. Iceland, mainly because they were frightened of global warming, which impacts the northern latitudes disproportionately, decided to decarbonize. There was resistance, again, to doing that. But the government of Iceland moved very deliberately, and within 15 years, they had decarbonized society and made it 100% energy independent. Today, 90% of, of Iceland's um, electric grid comes from local geothermal. Iceland went during that period from being the poorest country in Europe to being the fourth richest country by GDP on Earth. Now, unfortunately for Iceland, they spent virtually all of their newfound wealth on bundled derivatives, and they now are, <laughs> again, the poorest country in Europe. But they, um, but the, the economy in Iceland is now rebounding because they, the, the fundamentals are now strong. Iceland is one of the world's great energy exporters. It can't run lines across the Atlantic. It soon will be able to because uh, Great Britain is building these, um, you know, Gordon Brown's big wind farms in the North Atlantic, and they're close enough to Iceland that they're going to be able to connect with a, with a cable and sell their surpluses directly onto the European grid, and they're going to get very rich doing that. But today, what they do is they import bauxite from Jamaica and they use the surpluses to smelt the bauxite into aluminum, then they sell the ingots in the world market. That's their way of exporting energy. Sweden in 1996 decided to decarbonize and incidentally to close down their nuclear power industry. They shut their two biggest nuke plants, slapped a $150 ton tax on carbon, and, um, and you, again, you had tens of thousands of entrepreneurs rushing into that space to create new forms of energy from wind, from tidal, from solar, from geothermal, from, from sawmill waste and, and putrid garbage. And today, Sweden is the sixth richest country by GDP. It kind of goes back and forth, but, the, um, but Sweden, the important figure to remember is Sweden's energy use since 1996 has decreased by 9% and their economy has grown by 45%. Brazil, 20 years ago, decarbonized their transportation system, and as a direct result of that choice, Brazil today is enjoying the longest, while the entire world economy is kind of spiraling and collapse, Brazil is enjoying the longest, most robust economic expansion in the history of, of Latin America. 
Costa Rica at the same time decarbonized its electric grid, and Costa Rica today, uh, partially as a result of that choice, well, Costa Rica made some other good choices as well, like not having an army. And Costa Rica today, as a, as a result of that, is by far the wealthiest country in Central America. Um, Costa Rica, which is the smallest country in Central America, has a much larger economy than most of its neighbors, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua combined. And you can go on and on with those examples, but we have in our country much greater um, uh, renewable resources. We have much greater uh, geothermal than they have in Iceland. We're number uh, one or two in the world in geothermal. My home in Mount Kisco, New York is powered by geothermal. Um, virtually every home could be um, on the outside of the major cities, but yeah, the perception is that it, it's expensive, and it is expensive only though because of the subsidies that we're giving to the incumbents. But it's a lot cheaper if you eliminate those subsidies and they could compete on a level playing field. It's be, it'd be much cheaper than any of these subsidies, any coal or, 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 um, or oil or nuke. Um, the, of course, the cheapest form of energy is the kind that Kevin makes with his company because you can get more uh, per, per dollar in megawatts than you can from any, uh, you know, from any form of, uh, of energy that you're burning. The best investment that you can make if you do want to save energy is in, you know, is in smart building and smart materials. Um, we have, we're number two in solar in the world. The, uh, the Scientific American just uh, did a, an extensive study which they showed that we could power the entire existing U.S. energy grid from an area that is, represents 19% of the most barren desert land, the desert southwest, an area 75 miles by 75 miles, the entire U.S. energy grid. Of course, you wouldn't do that because if a cloud went over Arizona, you'd black out the whole country. <laughs> but, it, um, but there's enough energy there to do that. We have, another, um, we're number one by far in wind energy in this country. And um, the, uh, in, incidentally, the wind uh, tends to blow at night. And the sun, everybody knows this, shines in the day. <laughs> so we have, a, we have actually the ability to balance the grid if we had a, you know, a smart enough grid in this country. Uh, the Great Plains states the Saudi Arabia of wind. Um, North Dakota is actually the windiest place on Earth at sea level. We have enough wind, according to the Scientific American study, in Montana, North Dakota, and Texas to provide 100% of the entire North American energy grid three times over, even if every American owned an electric car. So we have, we have, a, uh, we have the energy here. We have an administration that is actually very, very determined and, um, and committed to transitioning to a new energy economy, and I've been um, lucky enough to be a senior advisor and meet uh, regularly with, with, um, with members of the administration who are, who are um, behind, behind this enterprise, who are supporting this enterprise, Stephen Chu and Lisa Jackson and Ken Salazar and a number of others. Um, but the obstacles that the administration or any administration faces are, there's three major obstacles. One is the existing subsidies to the incumbent, which gives them an unfair market advantage. Um, and those, you know, and the cap and trade system was supposed to, to, to level the playing field, but even with those subsidies, um, many of these new technologies were approaching uh, grid parity, and particularly with solar. Um, and I met with David Crane, who's the head of the, one of the biggest energy companies in this country, and one of the biggest nuke uh, fleets in this country. Um, this week, and he said, um, and he said to me that they're now betting very, very big on solar. And the reason is the innovation, the the uh, pace of innovation in solar is uh, is so dramatic, and wind doesn't have that. But the um, you know, in the past three years, we've gone, we've reduced the cost of solar um, by by two thirds, and that and those innovations are continuing, and they you know, and the the stuff that's in the pipeline now. Looks like the pace is actually accelerating. So we're at we're essentially at grid parity with the subsidies you can get from the government. We're at grid parity, which are minuscule compared to the subsidies to the incumbents. We're at grid parity, and we'll be at grid parity even without those subsidies soon. 
it's uh, within a couple of years. Um, and then, so we have, we have uh, the, the second impediment um, is, uh, is that, and this is one of the largest ones, is that we don't have a grid system in this country that can carry these new forms, these new currents of, of power. The grid system is antiquated. Um, it was underbuilt to start with. It's misaligned. It doesn't reach the big solar centers in the desert southwest. It doesn't reach the big wind centers in the Midwest. Um, and it's incapable of, of doing long-haul transmission of electrons. If you go to you know, North Dakota, virtually every farmer in North Dakota wants to put wind for turbines on their land. A, um, an acre of corn in North Dakota is worth about $800. An acre that has both corn and a wind turbine is worth $3,000. So every farmer wants to do this. It, it's gonna, it, and you have huge amounts of private capital. I'm on the board of the biggest green tech venture capital firm in the country, Vantage Point, and the most successful and extremely profitable, Calsters, the California Teachers Association, um, ranked us as number two in the last year, number four the year before, of all of their um, of all of their different funds in every um, space. So, you know, I, there, there is, there's money to be made in green tech these days. And, you know, Kevin is so loaded up with money. And it's, I, he just spends most of his time counting it from, he's <laughs> not even working on new stuff anymore. But, uh, but, but, um, the, if you look at, you know, if you go to North Dakota, every farmer wants to put wind turbines on their property. And you have huge amounts of private capital, not just from Vantage Point, but from, the, from, big, you know, from big players like Siemens, Investus, and General Electric, and T. Boone Pickens and Warren Buffett, lined up on heaps of cash that are surrounding the state of North Dakota, trying to get in there to build wind turbines in the state. The problem is that the North Dakota wind farmer cannot get his electrons to markets in Cleveland, Cincinnati, St. Louis, you know, New Orleans, or New York, because we can't do, they'll, they'll diffuse in the lines before they cross the North Dakota border. So we need to build a, you know, we need to have the same kind of program, um, and this is what Obama wants to do, and we're building it now piece by piece, but we need the same kind of commitment that, um, that Eisenhower had during the 1950s and 60s when he built the national highway system and connected every American home, every American community to a national system for, for commercial reasons and for national security reasons. And this is a national security issue. Um, we build, need to build a national marketplace. The third thing is, is really regulatory. We have, um, our electric system in this country is, is administered by uh, 50 different public utility commissions in 50 states and 120 control districts. Each one, it's a balkanized system, each one with its own Byzantine and arcane set of rules that, that restrict access to the grid. So we don't have a national marketplace for electricity. You know, my, my home in Mount Kisco, New York, is powered, as I said, by geothermal, but I also have two really good solar systems on the roof. And um, they are, so my home is a power plant. I produce a lot more energy with that home than I use. But, and I ought to be able to sell the surplus back to the grid and get market rates for it. But today, there's almost no jurisdiction where you can do that all the time reliably. There, increasingly, there's 36 states that are starting to, down that road, California, of course, is more advanced than anybody. And California has rationalized its rules we had, you know, we've got the free market capitalism is a great thing. It's the, it's, the, it's, the mo it's the most powerful, effective economic engine ever created. But it needs to be harnessed to a social purpose. Otherwise, it just creates huge concentrations of wealth and an oligarchy. And you can see this in the energy field is that, you know, we have irrational rules governing the, the, um, the distribution and sale of energy in this country. In every state but California, the way that utilities make money is by selling as much energy as possible. So my friend Jim Rogers is, runs Duke Energy. Duke Power is one of the biggest coal fleets in the country. I think he's got the second biggest. He wants to stop burning coal. But um, his share, and he wants to you know, get 
uh, Kevin down here there with his materials to, you know, to, to give incentives to people in his district to put in LED lights and to, to rebuild their, um, you know, to rip out the hot water boilers and to do all the things that we need to do and put in efficient appliances. But his shareholders want him to get his customers to leave their lights on all night and to leave the refrigerator doors open because that's how they make money. And it's unfair to put our, you know, these, the, the heads of these utilities, the CEOs of these utilities in a position where every day they have to wake up and make a decision about whether they're gonna serve the, you know, the interests of their shareholders or whether they're, they're gonna serve their duty to our country, to humanity, to the environment, to future generations, et cetera. And, but that's what he's gotta do every day. Now in California, my group, NRDC, rewrote the regulations in 1982 in this state so that the way the utilities make money is not by selling energy, but by, um, but by getting people to conserve and stop burning carbon. So in California, and this wasn't radical, you know, in, in, uh, before we had DREG, the way that utilities made money is they'd go out, they'd go to the PUC and they'd say, it was through infrastructure creation. They'd build a, they'd say, the PUC, we wanna build a, a dam, it's gonna cost us $100 million. We want to make 12 or 15 percent profits annually. We want to integrate that into the to the you know to the rate base. And here's the need, demonstrated need. The PUC would stamp it approved, and they'd go back and build the dam, and they made guaranteed money. Well, today in California, the way that Pacific Gas and Electric and Southern California Edison make money is they go to the utility and they say we want to go and rip the hot water boilers out of a million homes and replace them and the appliances, replace them with with appliances that use 20% of the energy. We want to go into every home and a million homes in our distribution grid and rip out the old Edison vacuum tube bulbs, 130 year old technology and replace them with solid state um, LED bulbs that are just as efficient now that can screw in and use 12% uh, of the power and last longer and save that money. And it's going to cost $100 million to do it. We want to make 15% profit. The PUC stamps it approved, and they can go do that. And as a result of that, Californians now use half the energy that everybody else in our country uses. Californians use 6,000 megawatt kilowatt hours per year. Every, you know, my state uses 13,000, and the average is between 11 and 14,000 a year. So, um, so you need rational rules that serve the public that make free market capitalism serve the public interest rather than serve you know, vast accumulations of wealth. And, um, and what we need to do is to create a national marketplace that's a rational marketplace, a marketplace that does what a market is supposed to do, which is to reward good behavior, which is efficiency, and to punish bad behavior, which is inefficiency and waste. Right now we have a marketplace in our country that is governed by rules that were rigged by the incumbents to favor the dirtiest, filthiest, most poisonous, most destructive, most addictive fuels from hell, rather than the cheap, clean, green, wholesome, and patriotic fuels from heaven. <laughs> and, and we need to change that dynamic around. And, and, you know, and if we do that, we create a system, a national unified grid that, um, that serves the interests of our country, that turns every American into an energy entrepreneur, every home into a power plant, and powers our country based on, you know, on, on, on our innovative powers and, and human resourcefulness and human intelligence and entrepreneurship and innovation, what Franklin Roosevelt called American industrial genius rather than Saudi Arabian oil. And we can do that. And we've done it before. Let me give you an example. 1979, we built an ARPANET grid. The federal government built an ARPANET grid in this country that connected every American home to the internet. Let me tell you something about that. You know, since we built that, we've spent $20 trillion in our country um, creating the internet. What today? Now, if somebody came to you in 1979 and said, guess what, I got a great idea. Let's spend $20 trillion and everybody will have personal computers people would have, you know, laughed them out of the room. But we did it and the costs were incremental and the benefits were so obvious as they came in that nobody even noticed that we spent 20 trillion dollars. But and it, you know, and and it's transformed our economy and our country and everything else. 
Well, in 1979, we built the ARPANET grid. And a year later, the head of IBM, the CEO of IBM, said that personal computers were a dead-end technology. That's a quote. There were a lot of companies that made the same bet. Dell, Wang, Honeywell, and a bunch of others, MCR. And they're, they don't make computers. They're out of that industry now because they made that bet. But um, what happened, you know, now most Americans have a personal computer. And what happened? Because we built the marketplace. We built the marketplace and the, you know, the conduct followed. So, and what happened to the cost of information, of bits and bytes? It plummeted to almost zero. I would say to zero, actually. You know, one of the companies that we have at, at Vantage Point is called um, uh, Chacha. Have any of you heard of it, Chacha? Raise your hand. It's all the young people raising their hands. So Chacha is, <laughs> a lot more people are raising their hands. Okay, so Chacha. <laughs> Chacha is a company that if you call your cell phone 242242, that's Chacha, you can then dial any question you want and, and it will answer the question usually within a minute. So I, I was in China a couple of weeks ago and I was showing it to some Chinese friends of mine and I said, and they said, I said, ask me any question. They said, what was Mao Zedong's favorite lunchtime meal? And I put it in there and then it comes back, spicy brown bean soup um, on fried brown rice, right? So that's, that's, and it's free. There's no cost to it. So this is free information forever because we built the marketplace. Well, that's the same thing that's gonna happen to electrons if we build a marketplace for energy. In 19, in 1996, we built a national unified marketplace for telecommunications. Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act. He told all the baby bells, you've got to consolidate your lines, you've got to, um, you've got to unify, have a national unified grid. You've got to let everybody on them. You can't keep people off. No preferences, the lowest cost provider prevails in the marketplace. And it created a national marketplace for telecommunications. And that spawned or triggered a telecommunications telecommunications revolution in our country. And all these little gadgets we have now, like iPhones and stuff, are the offspring of that revolution. But what happened to the cost of telecommunications? Well, it's dropped to almost zero. Yesterday, I saw an ad on, in, the, in, the, um, in the airport for a company called Vonage, which is a telecommunications company that promises unlimited, long distance, overseas, and local calls for $19 unlimited. So that's practically free. That's essentially free telecommunications. You know, two months ago I was in Miami and made a, a phone call, five minute phone call approximately to London and it cost me $74. Well that is the old way. But the new way because of the grid is free telecommunications forever. And that's what's going to happen to electrons as soon as we build national grid for electricity in this country. Um, and let me you know, give you another uh, example. We have now, that's, that's from this state, um, one of our companies, one of Vantage Point's company that we created is called, uh, is called BrightSource. And BrightSource today is building, I think it's the biggest power plant in America. We're building in the Mojave Desert, 2.7 gigawatts to a typical nuke plant is, is one gigawatt, 1,000 megawatts. So 2.7 gigawatts, and it's a solar thermal plant. This isn't the, you know, the big old solar PVC panels that your grandmother used to nail to her roof. These are, it's a mirror farm in the desert. It's a, they, they build a scaffolding, a tower, and they put a, a turbine on top of that tower. And then they surround it with these giant concentric rings of giant mirrors that are manipulated by computers to reflect the sunlight onto that turbine. And a half an hour after the sun comes up in the morning, it's at 750 degrees Fahrenheit. So, and it's a very good way to generate you know, energy and to do it cheaply. So we're building that plant for, we're building in about two and a half years, Bechtel is building it. It takes 10 years to build a coal plant minimum it take at least 30 years to build a nuke plant. We're building it for, for $3 billion a gigawatt. Well, a coal plant 
cost $3 billion a gigawatt. A nuke plant, the last one they built was in Finland, and that cost $11 billion by some estimates, by their estimates, but most people think it's $14 billion. So for you know, a quarter of the money, we're building the same size plant. But once you build our plant, it's free energy forever because the photons are hitting the earth every day for free. All we have to do is pick them up and put them in the lines. Once you build that coal plant for the same three billion, now you gotta go cut down the Appalachians, ship them across the country in rail yards, wreck the roads, warp the, the reason we can't have high-speed rail in this country is every rail line in this country has been warped by the coal gondolas because they're so heavy, you can't drive a train on them fast. That's a cost, another cost I didn't mention. And then you burn the coal, you know, and kill 60,000 people and poison every fish in America. Once you build an oil plant, now you gotta go to Saudi Arabia, punch holes in the ground, bring up the oil, refine it expensively. Um, you know, genuflect to the sheiks who despise democracy and are hated by their own people, get in periodic wars that cost 4.3 trillion, ship it across the Atlantic with a military escort that Exxon is not paying for it, you and I are, spill it all over the Gulf, spill it all over Valdez, <laughs> burn the oil and poison everybody in the country. So that's the cost you know, of the oil. And that happens after you spend the $3 billion on their plant. But our plant, once you've been spending $3 billion, it's free energy forever. So here's the mathematics. Um, we use, in our country, at peak demand, 1,000 gigawatts of energy. Um, we, at 2% growth over 50 years, which is the life of a power plant, we need to double that. Now, half of that, 500 gigawatts, is carbon-based. So we, we need to double that, but you can cut it in half using Kevin's technology, using Kevin's building materials. So, and that's gonna be mandated. You know, the, that's the states, the localities, the cities, which are still you know, functional compared to the federal government, are mandating that we're gonna all have to be using this stuff anyway. So we're gonna cut that in half. So we essentially need 1,000 gigawatts to decarbonize America completely and give us free energy forever. Um, at $3 billion a gigawatt, that's $3 trillion which is less than the cost of the Iraq war. So for, and it's probably, you know, it's probably, it's gonna be complicated and it's be, you know, difficult, but it's probably not as difficult as, you know, having a war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, and we can do it. Um, and at the end of that, we have free energy forever. So, and let, let, let me tell you this, in, in 1929, in October, just before the stock market crash, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 385. 13 years later, in 1942, the Dow Jones was at 85. So in all of those 13 years, the, the great stimulus package that we call the New Deal was able to keep thousands of Americans in their homes, or millions of Americans in their homes, millions of Americans on their farms, thousands of banks from closing, millions of Americans to be employed, and, you know, not starving to death, but it was not robust enough to restore the marketplace. And then in 1940, um, a year before Pearl Harbor, when we started the Lend-Lease Program with Great Britain, um, Franklin Roosevelt gave this extraordinary speech to our country. It was one of the most important speeches in our history. And he said, you know, he said, we're going to build, we're gonna mobilize ourselves as a nation. And he said, we're gonna build 50,000 airplanes a year. Now, his aides later admitted before he made the speech that he had pulled that number out of thin air. The five minutes before he sat down to make the speech, the year before we had built 2,800 aircraft in this country. And he said, we're gonna build 50,000 a year. He said, we're gonna build 25,000 tanks a year. We're gonna build a ship a day. We're gonna build a battleship a month, an aircraft carrier every four months. And he went on and on and said, we're gonna do this every month and every year until this war is over and won. And people laughed at him. He was ridiculed by editorial pages on the left and the right all across the country. They said no industrial mobilization of that kind has ever happened in the history of mankind. He was overreaching, he overpromised. But Roosevelt went immediately out to Detroit and he said to the automakers, you're not making automobiles anymore. You're making aircraft and tanks and half tracks and amphibious vehicles and bombs and detonators. And within six weeks, 
they had retooled their plans. Within six months, they had met his goals. Within 12 months, they had surpassed them. The following year, we built 96,000 aircraft in this country. We had full employment. 160,000 women went to Detroit with Rosie the Riveter and found jobs where they'd been blackballed before. 200,000 blacks went to Detroit where they'd been blackballed and found jobs. And you had full employment and people had money in their pockets and they started betting it on the marketplace again and you had a market recovery that made us the richest nation in the world. We had half the wealth on the face of the earth for the next 50 years. Um, well today, you know, we have a big advantage that Roosevelt didn't have. We have, because Roosevelt was building stranded assets, he was building bombs and tanks and detonators that were being sent over to Europe to be blown up. But we have the capacity today to build, you know, to employ millions of Americans, putting turbines, wind turbines on every farm in North Dakota and the, and the Great Plains states that wants it, to uh, build towers and string wire down, uh, you know, across the United States to build a grid system down the existing right-of-ways and the railroad tracks and we and and to employ millions of Americans bolting uh, photovoltaic arrays to every southern and western facing roof in America and then teams of men and women who will go into every home that wants it and pressure test the home and put in Kevin's windows and you know put in and uh, blow in cellulosic insulation and and at the end of that we have a system that gives us free energy forever, or close to it. And that's the biggest permanent tax break that has ever occurred in history. Because energy is the biggest business cost, the first, second biggest business cost to most of the industries in our country. So we are, we're able then to restore our competitiveness as a nation, but we also, you know, you, that would just set the stage, the infrastructure, to develop um, the entrepreneurial te technologies that also put us back in the game. Now the Chinese know this, and I spend a lot of time in China, and China already, you know, understands this. The Chinese, in that, if the Waxman-Markey bill had, had passed, it would have been mandated that we increase our solar deployment by 37% over the next five years. The Chinese have already committed themselves, and they actually do what, you know, they say they're gonna do. They've already decided, they've already mandated an increase in solar, solar deployment by 20,000% over five years. They're increasing their wind deployment by 1,200%. They're spending $758 billion on, on, on wind and solar over the next five years. You know, and we were going to spend, you know, we were going to spend, I think, uh, six to ten billion dollars. They're spending $758 billion. They see this as the arms race of the 21st century. And if you look at all of the areas, you know, they're now you know, investing huge amounts in electric cars, et cetera. So um, um, I, I just, I'll say this, and then I, I, I was going to talk. I think I'm running out of time. Can somebody tell me that? Well, how much time do I have? Or have I used it up already? What? We're almost out of time. Okay. Well, let me, can I make two more points? Okay, I, I, let me to make these two points because one of the big questions I've left hanging is most of the fuel in this country, the liquid fuel that we get from Saudi Arabia, et cetera, is not coming from, uh, is not being you know, put in power plants. It's being put in vehicles. And how do you solve that problem? Um, and we're still going to need liquid fuel for heavy trucks and aviation and you know, heavy vehicles. You need liquid fuel, and you can get that from a number of sources, including natural gas, which we have in huge abundance now, and, and biomass. But um, the, our automobile industry is going to quickly transfer to electric, and uh, I'll tell you why. And a couple of years ago, you know, we built one of the first um, electric car companies, which was Tesla. We were the number one investor, and Advantage Point was. We just sent it, sold it to Mercedes-Benz and made a, a big profit on it. But Tesla, if you've seen a Tesla or driven one, it's, it's an extraordinary experience. It's the fastest car on the road in America. It goes from zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. It makes your car at phase, like you don't need the Botox anymore, right? So, um, 
and it's fully electric, and it gets 250 miles on a charge. And it, car and driver said it's the most beautiful car on the road. So, and, it, you know, and, and that car, and seeing that car, and we got, um, we got Henry Ford to, um, I, I mean, Billy Ford, well, to drive that car, and he went back to Detroit. When we went up there to Detroit, when they were giving out the TARP funds, and said, you know, don't, don't be building these hybrids because the Japanese already own that technology. They, they bought US patents, they own it. Let's just leapfrog them right to electric because that's where everybody's going. So at that time, they said, no, 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 that's a long way off. But they saw Tesla, they understand now the economics. And this year at the Detroit Auto Show, every automobile company has an electric car. And that's where they're all going. And if you talk to them, they're all going to say that. Why? Because the economics, the marketplace is going to drive them there. To drive an electric car over the life of the car costs six cents a mile. To drive an internal combustion engine in Europe um, or most places in, this, in the world costs 60 cents a mile. It costs 45 cents a mile in this country because of the huge subsidies that we give to, the, to oil. But um, we have another company called Better Place, and Better Place right now is in the process of transforming Israel to all electric vehicles. And they're gonna do it within three years. Right now we have teams in Israel that are putting electric sockets next to every parking place in Israel. And most of the gas stations in Israel were building a structure called a swap station. It looks like an American car wash. You drive your car in, um, a computer lifts you up on a hoist, slides out your exhausted battery, slides in a new one. You drive off with 120 miles on the, on the charge. The battery is not owned by the car owner. The battery is owned by the electric utility in Israel so that a car owner never has to pay for it. And that is the secret sauce. Because the reason that, the, that, that electric cars don't work in this country is the batteries cost $20,000. So nobody's going to buy a, a $20,000 car that costs $40,000 because the, the battery's in it. That's the, you know, the problem with the Volt. You know, but the battery pays itself back within five years. You know, you're making money on it. But Americans look at the sticker price. They don't look at what's going to happen in five years. So, you know, that's the problem. So Shai Agassi, who started Better Place, said, how do you make them not have to pay for the battery? They pay for it as they drive the car. Um, and this there was the solution. And the Israel Electric Utility, which is our joint venture partner, is using those batteries while they're in the station, while they're in people's homes, plugged in at night, or in their offices, plugged in there during the day, as reservoirs for variable power for huge wind farms and solar farms, solar thermal plants that they're now building in the Negev Desert. Um, so the, for them, that's where they're, you know, they can even out the grid um, and shave, shave off peaks using these batteries. The cars themselves are being built by Renault and Nissan, and the cars cost $12,000 to build. There's eight different models running from sports car to minivan. They're great cars. They go, um, and, they, and they never break down. They, they go from zero to 60 in about five seconds. They never break down because there's nothing really to break down. There's no moving parts. You know, there, I think there are five or six moving parts, the wheels, the axles, the windshield wipers, and the, you know, the doors. And, and so there's nothing really to break down. An internal combustion engine has 270 parts, and they're all prone to break down, and that's part of the cost of driving that car over the life of the vehicle. Um, and the, the, and, but, so they cost $12,000 for us to manufacture this car, but we are giving them away for free to every driver in Israel. The, the same way that your cell phone operator can give you a cell phone for free, and then they make the money based on the cost, we make our money back based on charging a premium for the power that that driver uses over the next three years, five years, or seven years, depending on the contract. The reason we're able to do that is because it's so cheap to drive an electric car. The reason for that is that internal combustion engines are just inherently inefficient. Why? Because everywhere you go, you're, you're carrying a seven or 500 pound power plant with you. So if you go buy a 10 pound bag of groceries, you got to bring a 500 pound power plant with you. And that means everything else in the car has to be reinforced and it's heavier and it gets less, less and less efficient. But if you're driving that electric car and it, they're so inefficient that it's actually, you produce less carbon in the atmosphere if you're driving an electric car and you're getting your power from the dirtiest, filthiest power plant in America, you're still putting less carbon 
in the atmosphere than you are if you're driving an internal combustion engine. That's how inefficient they are. So um, it, we have, when we get done with Israel, we have a contract to do Denmark, the same thing. We just signed a contract. We have a contract to do Australia. We have a contract to do Toronto, the city of Toronto. We have a contract to do Hawaii. We just signed a contract with the UK. We have 30 countries in contract negotiations to do the same thing. So this is coming. We are at the tipping point now. You're going to see a cascade happen over the next five years. And the big issue is not how to do the cars. It's really how to get the grid ready so that it can accept you know, entire neighborhoods charging their car at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they return from work. You know, they, Boulder, Colorado, already did this, and the transformers all blew off the poles, you know, because they got a lot of electric cars there. So you need to solve those problems. You need to make a smart grid that's able to do that, and you need some energy storage, and we have those problems solved. We just need widespread penetration and adoption of them. I'll say one last thing, which is this. The issue that I started off with, which is, and I've said this for 27 years, people have said to me, what's the most important environmental law that we could pass in this country? And I've always said the same thing. Free market capitalism. To have a true free market capitalism. Because Why is that? It's because the marketplace promotes efficiency. And efficiency means the elimination of waste. And pollution is waste. And in a true free market, would encourage us to properly value our natural resources. And it's the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. But in a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. But what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. Corporations are externalizing machines. They're constantly devising ways to get somebody else to pay their cost of production. And if you're in a polluting industry, the, the best way that you can spend a surplus dollar at the end of the year is to invest in our political process, which is just, you know, a campaign finance system in our country is just a system of legalized bribery. And you get your hooks into a public official and then get that public official to dismantle the marketplace, to give you a competitive edge or monopoly control, and then use it to get him to help you privatize the commons. To, evade, you know, to get to abolish the environmental laws so that you can you know, privatize the waters, the rivers, the fisheries. You can privatize the air. I have three sons with asthma. And they get asthma attacks on bad air days from ozone and particulates. So somebody is making money by privatizing the air in my children's lungs. And it's illegal. You can't do it. But they get away with it because they have corrupted our democracy and subverted our democracy. And what all the federal laws that we passed after Earth Day 1970, the 28 laws, all of those laws were intended to restore free market capitalism in our country by forcing actors in the marketplace to pay the true costs of getting their products to market. And what we do as water keepers is, you know, we go out and sue polluters. We're, 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 we sue the cheaters, the people who are cheating the free market. We don't even consider ourselves environmentalists anymore. We're free marketeers. We are out there insuring and, and patrolling free market capitalism to make sure it continues to function. We go out and we catch the cheaters, the polluters, and we just say to them, we're going to force you to internalize your costs the same way that you internalize your profits. Because as long as somebody is cheating the marketplace, it distorts the entire market. And it sends the wrong signals, and it, and it, um, and it, and none of us gets the advantages of the of the efficiency, the prosperity, and the democracy that free market capitalism is intended to provide our society. And what we have to understand as Americans is that there's a huge difference between free market capitalism, which makes a nation more efficient, more prosperous, and more democratic, and the kind of corporate crony capitalism which has been now embraced on Capitol Hill thanks to the power of the big polluters, which is as antithetical to efficiency, prosperity, and democracy in America as it is in Nigeria. 
So, you know, all of the things that we're fighting for and all of the, you know, things that you have an opportunity to do in your job on a day-to-day -day basis is not about just about saving our environment and, you know, and bringing, but it's about bringing prosperity to our communities, it's about transforming America in a way that, you know, keeps us consistent with our values. Abraham Lincoln said, America is a great nation because we're a good nation. And he warned that if we ever stopped being a good nation, we'd quickly lose our greatness as well. And we have an opportunity to maintain that greatness by highlighting our values. And one of the ways that you do that is making sure that we're responsible to future generations, and that we're creating examples and templates and models for the rest of the world. And in doing that, we're also you know, ensuring the future of America's prosperity and the strength of our economy and the leadership of our government and our, our economy by, um, you know, by doing something that, that eliminates costs and that gives us communities that everybody wants to live in. So I want to thank you for coming here and, you know, and, and keeping yourselves open to these changes and, for, um, and if there's anything that I can do to help you adopt um, you know, in, in, your, uh, in, in your business or your utilities or whatever, you know, your facilities, these kind of new materials. Give me your card before you leave here and, you know, I'll send you materials and, and opportunities to, to do things that, um, you know, that are consistent with all of these things, with good economics and, and good American values. And I, I want to thank you for, for having me and, and, uh, and letting me, you know, talk to you about these important issues. So thank you very much.